fellow investors. Welcome to another episode of Ritter on Real Estate, where we teach you how to passively invest like a pro. Today, my guest is Andrew Kerr, and he's the founder of Phi by REI. It's a company dedicated to helping individuals in the nonprofit sector achieve financial independence through real estate investing. He's someone who's dedicated his life to helping others through working in nonprofits, and he's passionate about making sure mission-driven people don't have to sacrifice their financial well-being to do the work they love. Because of his success in investing, he's been able to have the ability to focus his efforts on more in the nonprofit sector. He's scaled two small nonprofits to over a million dollars a year in donations, and he's working toward a goal of raising $25 million for charity. You know, Andrew lives with his wife in New Orleans and uh, is working to educate readers and listeners about the power of real estate investing to achieve financial independence. Andrew, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. So um, really interesting, right? We, we don't hear about a lot of people that are, are using real estate really to kind of supplement or fund their, uh, their, their nonprofit endeavors. So I think that that's a fantastic way to, to use your earnings from real estate and a way to give back. So really excited to hear about your story today. And so with that, why don't we start from the top? Tell folks a little more about who you are and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. So as you mentioned, my wife and I live here in New Orleans, you know, born out in California. My dad was an IBM guy. So it was always instilled in me. You get good grades, you go to college, you get a degree, and then your life is set, right? You go mm -hmm. and you end up working for a company for 30 or 40 years. <clears throat> and what I found out, like when I was in high school, the classes I liked, I did really well in. The classes I didn't like, I was dumb or smart enough to do just enough to get a D to pass. So I ended up not going to college. And at, you know, 18, 19, I stumbled into the mortgage industry and 19 started being a loan officer. By 20, I was doing well enough to buy my uh, first home, started doing something called house hacking. And then by 23, I was a partner in a mortgage company and we grew that mortgage company to about 15 people. And there at 25 had this quarter life crisis. You know, I just broken up with my business partner, broken up with a long-term relationship. I thought I was on this fast track of like getting a house and growing a business and realized like, oh crap, is this going to be my life for the next 30 or 40 years? And at the same time, you know, 2007, 2008 was happening, real sort of fateful experience. I, it was either go get drunk for 4th of July at the beach with all my buddies, sort of nip, uh, typical thing you do in your 20s, or go volunteer with this organization out in the middle of Iowa doing disaster response cleanup. And that sort of one week experience sort of changed my life. You know, one week turned into two weeks, turned into two months. To where I ended up going to work for this nonprofit. And, you know, my starting stipend was $800 a month. So I went from, you know, six figures, having a business, having a house, uh, dipping my toe into real estate to hating life to now all of a sudden I was in this nonprofit sector, just loving life, loving what I was doing, felt passionate about, you know, my life, like I felt like I had a purpose, reinvigorated. And then, realized I wasn't making any money. So I said, Hey, you know, I've got all this experience from the real estate, you know, mortgage industry, I'm going to start investing heavily in real estate and use that to build financial security and long term wealth. So I can keep doing this nonprofit thing that doesn't pay, at, you know, really at all. And that sort of took me on, you know, a very wild ride where with the nonprofit, the first one I worked with was a disaster response you know, I ended up uh, working in places like Haiti to Indonesia and Philippines, had the chance to meet some really cool individuals from all around the world, meet with hedge fund billionaires to, you know, building up this real estate portfolio to now I, I work with a nonprofit that uh, supports uh, a branch of the military. Um, and sort of, I'll, I'll sort of end with uh, around that point in 2016, I ended up building up a, a real estate portfolio 
of uh, 40 rental units. So it was very active and then decided uh, through sort of a small epiphany to, you know, go passive uh, because passive was an easier route. And I didn't want to have this giant real estate business anymore where it took a ton of time. Gotcha. Wow. That's a great journey. A ton to unpack there. I mean, so what I'm hearing is um, a little bit of a different path than, than most, right? You started out with a ton of financial success. I mean, kudos to you for kind of taking that path to, to skip college, which I think every day has a lower ROI on it as it becomes more expensive. Yeah. Get right into business, learn it, become a partner very early be at the at the point where at 25 you're you're having these great problems to have right where where <laughs> yeah. you've you've now grown this business and you're like okay now you know what do i do and then you have this moment which is man i don't know like i probably would have been at the beach i gotta tell you at the fourth of july so so kudos to you for going and volunteering and that just sent you down a completely different path right and and you've been able to, instead of using real estate as kind of the end all be all, it sounds like real estate for you has really become the mechanism or the machine to kind of fund your, your true passion and your true pursuits, right? Yeah, you know, I think most people actually start this way, right? We get into real estate to build wealth. And then what ends up happening is a lot of us get active in real estate and get too active and it ends up turning into this whole other business. And, you know, some of it is just the way marketing is done in the real estate world. It's like, you know, we want to interview people on podcasts that, you know, added a, a thousand units in 2.5 months, or mm -hmm. you know, we show those crazy <laughs> success stories. So it was like, you know, I got five units and then I was like, oh, I got to get the 10. And then I was like, oh, I got to get the 25. And then I was like, all right, I got to get to, a, you know, 50. And then I'm going to get to a hundred units. And when I hit 40 units, I was like, you know, I don't want to actively manage real estate. I want real estate to be a tool to let me, you know, have financial security and to be able to do the type of work that I love. And don't get me wrong. Like I love real estate, but it's not something that I want to do for 40, 50 hours a week. And I think that's okay. Right. And I think yeah. that's kind of what you're saying is the marketing is like, you got to be out and acquiring and doing all this, but there's a very different path that you've been able to, been able to find and like that's great because not everybody's super passionate about real estate there's a lot of people that love their day jobs right yeah, yeah. but um but it sounds like having that investment in real estate and that stability allows you to to kind of do the day job you'd like and, and i imagine have more security in doing that as well yeah yeah absolutely so when um so tell me a little bit about you know you've so you've got this active portfolio, you've got 40 rentals that you're managing, right? And, and then now you've said you've moved over time, you know, to be more of a passive investor. So, so how have you done that? You know, what did you, how did you kind of exit the active side? And then what are you doing now that you're a passive investor? Yeah. Oh, a lot, a lot of good questions there. So I, one of the ways I started was college housing. So, you know, I was in my late twenties and I said, great, you know, I, I understand college students. This is an easy, you know, niche for me to get into. And then at the same time, cause I've been doing nonprofit work, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters and very poor parts of the world. I said, you know, Hey, I, I can go to the, you know, rough, rough parts of Durham or Raleigh. This was back when I was in North Carolina. And I said, you know, these are easy compared to some of the places I've been. <laughs> sure. So then I started doing affordable housing, you know, had some section eight as well. And to me, it just fit really well. And what, what ended up happening was I had started building this really big portfolio and affordable housing ex is extremely challenging, but I was working on this deal again, you know, trying to shoot for the moon, get as many units as possible. I had bought up about 15, 16% of a, a neighborhood. And I had this goal to buy up the rest of the neighborhood. So I was out uh, putting together some plans to buy up the rest of the neighborhood. I was starting to get uh, commitments from other investors. I was talking with banks to secure a couple million in financing. And I just started talking with a commercial broker. And I said, look, you know, 
I have some rough ideas what I, I think this should value based on if I bought up all of these units. It was this old like combination of quads all together. And I said, well, if I can mm -hmm. get all of them, there's 130 units in there. I know what it should be, you know, what I can increase the rents on, you know, but I'd love to get your professional opinion on what I could value this, this whole thing at. And the idea was to raise some money, buy out all, all the individual owners, uh, put it together back as like an apartment complex and then fix it all up and then sell it. And then, you know, I walk away with a million bucks and the investors are happy. And the commercial broker said, you know, Andrew, you've got a proven record. You put a plan in place. Would you be open to just selling? Cause we could sell off your portion with all the plans you you've already done. And you could walk away. And at the same time, I was just starting to put a property management company in place for those affordable housing units. That way I could keep scaling if I brought it on. And when the commercial broker brought this up, I was like, holy crap, like that would be awesome. Like I don't have to actively manage this anymore because these were challenging tenants. And these are tenants that, you know, didn't have internet access or if they did, they didn't have steady bank account. So they weren't paying online, which mean you had to collect rents, you mm -hmm. had to go pick up money orders. Um, extremely, extremely challenging. And then I realized like, hey, I can sell this off. And this will all of a sudden make me an accredited investor. So I sold off uh, five of the buildings, um, paid off some of the silent partners I had one of the buildings I had, I 1031 did into a couple other properties. And then I sort of realized like now I can invest in some of these bigger syndication deals that I'd been wanting to get into. And that started to work so well that then I uh, over 2017 and 18 ended up liquidating the rest of my portfolio and started investing more into passive deals because it was this, again, it was this thing of like, Hey, I built up this giant thing. It's taking all this time. Yes, it's building long-term wealth for me and building some cash flow, but this is a job and I don't want it to be a job. I wanted it, you know, I got into real estate to build security so I could do the nonprofit work that, you know, what wasn't paying very well at the time. Um, and that was sort of how I transitioned into passively investing. Gotcha. And so what was it? What is it that attracted you to um, to to choose to invest in in larger syndications, like you said? Yeah, there's a couple of things. So, you know, you can go back and look at like 2014 and 2015, and people are like, "Oh, we've had a huge run up. Like the market could crash at any point in time." And like every year since then, mm -hmm. and so by you know 2016, 2017, I, I was feeling a bit over leveraged where you know, I was using creative financing, I was bringing in partners and investors, you know, we were structuring deals. And I said, you know, maybe I should start to deleverage, like, you know, in my late 20s, early 30s, I was fine with that risk, because I was single and dating at the time. But then I started realizing, like, hey, we're getting serious in a relationship, I don't want to be so leveraged, I don't want to have so much risk. So, there was sort of that piece of it of like, let, let me look at deleveraging and the idea of not having, you know, loans where I was the personal guarantor was really attractive. So I could invest in a syndication and the only thing at risk was the capital that I was putting in. Um, the fact that it would be locked up for three, five, seven years, I really liked that because one of the things I found is while I've always gotten better with money, I found if you eliminate temptation, then it, it makes it really easy, right? So like, I don't let my wife bring cookies into the house because <laughs> they're here, I'll eat them, right? So same thing of like, great, I can put 25 or 50 grand into a syndication, it's locked up for seven years, versus if it's sitting in cash or a money market account, well, hey, I could go out and buy something with it, or I could invest it in something else that might not be as good as real estate. So that was the other piece of it. And then the last thing was I wanted uh, diversification, right? So I still wanted to be in real estate, but I wanted to be in multiple geographic areas because I had this idea of when there's going to be a pullback or a recession, it's not going to be like 
20, uh, 2007 or 2008 where everything fell, I thought it might be more regional. So at that time, I was all in North Carolina. So I said, you know, I'd love to be in three to five different geographic areas. That way, if one geographic area takes a hit, you know, I'm in four others. So again, it was this, and I think a lot of investors go through this phase of, right, where it's like, hey, you got to do some work yourself, you, you got to um, be more active to start getting ahead to fix your financial situation, then your risk tolerance changes. And then you can, once you start to build a little bit of wealth, then you can start to think about broadening out of like, you know, I wanted to diversify, I didn't want to diversify out of real estate quite yet, but I wanted to diversify in real estate of not having debt in my name, let someone else um, do that, you know, let me be diversified across multiple geographic areas. Um, so that was sort of why, why I really liked you know, investing in syndications, or at least at that time, why it appealed to me. Interesting, really, really interesting. I loved your answer because I, I, uh, two of the three things you said are not things that I typically hear when, when I ask people that question. So I love the different perspective that you were really looking to to limit your risk, right? Mm -hmm. Limit your exposure. You not you don't have to sign on the debt. The only thing at risk is the money you've invested, right? So it really limits limits your risk, limits your exposure. And then I love the idea of forced savings, because like you said, if you've, if you've got it in front of you, it's tempting. I, I get the cookie analogy, man, like same thing in our house, like we, we just got to keep it out of the house. And but that forced savings, so you, you're putting this money aside that because a, a lot of people, a lot of investors I talk to will say, you know, they look at the lack of liquidity at, as a con for that type of investment. So I love hearing the other side of it. And it's actually can be a forced savings strategy where you're building equity over time, right? You're, you're getting those returns and, and, and that money is going to be there. That capital is going to be there at, at, you know, in five, seven years to, to use again. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, I, I was really fortunate where my early business experience gave me a, a lot of, um, I guess experience is the way to say it. But then in the nonprofit work, I have had the opportunity to sit down with so many millionaires. And I don't know if it was because I was coming from a nonprofit perspective and I was very, very curious and I'd ask great questions and actually be interested in what they're saying. You know, people love talking about themselves, but mm -hmm. I learned so much from sitting down with these multimillionaires and just honestly being curious of like, how'd you do that? Like, how'd you go from a sheet metal worker to an angel investor in Palo Alto? Or, you know, how did you go from Iowa to moving to Trinidad and Tobago in the seventies to become a, um, work in this business, then you became a partner and then you came back to the U S and like have all these interesting routes. And it gave me a lot of cool opportunities. And, you know, one of the things I got to do was go to the Dreamforce conference that's put on by Salesforce. And I got to hear a talk by uh, Richard Branson. And one of the, my key takeaway from him was, he said, I always try to firewall my businesses from each other. That way, if one business fails, it doesn't have this domino effect where it, it knocks everything down. And he told a story about how when he started the airlines, he made a deal with the airlines where, hey, if the business fails, you're taking back all, all of the planes. And that just stuck with me this, like, how could I segment parts of my financial life to build security and to build diversification and not basically have a house of cards that if if something happens, then you, you're getting wiped out. And, you know, those experiences listening to millionaires and billionaires and learning from them is what drove me towards that. Hey, let's get debt out of my name. Let's do the, have the sponsor take that on. Let's diversify across multiple geographic areas. Um, how can I be self-aware of knowing what my strengths and weaknesses are and doing things like creating that for savings? Yeah, that that's really interesting. I love that perspective. And, and you started that you said in, in which year did you start kind of moving out of the passive 20 moving out of the active 2016? Yeah. And so how how has that gone now that you've kind of moved out and you moved into being a passive investor? I mean, how, how have those investments gone? 
so far they've been doing great. I actually have, um, you know, one coming back uh, this fall where they're um, prepping, getting ready for the sale, and then we'll get our, our final distribution. They've gotten, you know, I've got my quarterly distributions ever since I, I invested in it back in 2016. Um, you know, one or two deals had a problem early on where they thought they would start, you know, their quarterly distribution you know, six months in, they had some trouble with getting contractors or bids coming in higher with the value add. But outside of that, everything's been going going really, really well. So, um, you know, overall, I'm really, really happy with it. But I think some of that is people, I, I've had some friends invest in deals where they've had losses. And to me, that goes back to they didn't do the due diligence properly. They just said, Oh, yeah, great. The numbers look good. I like the IRR and the cash on cash. And oh, yeah, it's a preferred return. That means it's guaranteed. And it's like, no, it's not really <laughs> guaranteed. And, you know, they just throw the money in there and, and don't do their due diligence. And I think that's one place where people get tripped up is like, oh, it's passive. They're, they're taking care of it. Well, no, you still should do your own due diligence up front. And you should still manage that manager or that sponsor, like you should be checking in when you get your quarterly statement, you know, read through that. If they do a call every quarter, you should be getting on that call and asking questions if things aren't looking right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that. You guys need to be listening to Andrew here. We talked about that a lot on the podcast, right? Like even though you're passive, it doesn't mean you're, you're totally complacent. And I think those are a lot of really good tips. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to, to expand on that a little bit. So tell us some of the, you know, some of the lessons you've learned being a passive investor, I think particularly around doing that due diligence up front, vetting those sponsors, or what's that process look like for you now? Yeah, so I look at it as sort of three steps or maybe three parts. So like if I get a deal brought to me, um, you know, I'll, I'll get an email or get a call that says, Hey, you know, we're, we're getting ready to open a new fund or we're looking at this deal. Um, we're getting ready to do a call in two weeks or in a week from now. I look at three things. First, I vet the geographic area. So I, I don't even care about the deal yet. I want to know, Hey, this is going to be in Oklahoma city, or they're talking about Dallas or Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm going to vet the geographic area. Do I feel good about how that geographic area is going to look over the next 10 years? So if they're saying it's a three to five year hold period, I want that uh, area to be looking strong for at least seven to 10 years in case there's an issue and they can't sell or we have trouble refinancing we, and the property has to be held longer. Um, is there job growth? Is there uh, population growth? You know, I'll, I'll go look to make sure one, is that geographic area solid? And do I feel comfortable with it? Um, and then from a personal standpoint, if I already have like three or four deals in that geographic area, it, it might not cause me to not want to invest in that deal. But I go back to my personal criteria of wanting to be diversified across multiple geographic areas. So if I look and say, great, hey, I've actually got too much capital in the area, it's just a okay deal, I'll pass on it. So mm -hmm. after I vetted the geographic um, area, then I actually go into vetting the deal itself. You know, are they doing a value add strategy? Um, what are their current rents? What are they estimating for market rents? You know, one of the things I found when people put together the pro forma, some of they're, they're too optimistic, right? I like to be, I'm probably a little too conservative on my underwriting. I found a lot of sponsors are too optimistic where they'll say, hey, we're going to move rents from 800 to 1200. I'll go and say, hey, let me use Rentometer, a tool like that, or let me go look to see what other apartments in, in that city are going to actually rent for. And hey, they're estimating they can increase rents to 1200. I actually think 1100 is going to be tough that $100 difference can make a huge ripple effect uh, on your exit value uh, of the property and on your cash flow. So I'll actually vet the deal. Um, what's the property look like? Do I feel like, hey, they're only estimating, you know, seven to eight grand to turn a unit and to fix it up. You know, all the HVAC systems are over a, a decade old. Eh, you know, their, their CapEx is too small. So I'll actually look into the nitty gritty of the deal, how they do the poor pro forma. Do I actually think it's realistic? Um, are they looking at, you know, even little things like, 
I had a deal where, where they were looking at it and they didn't have the taxes, um, the taxes they only had increasing 2% a year. The property was due for a, uh, when I went to the tax records, it was due for a um, oh, reassessment shoot. reassessment yeah. in, in a year and, and they missed that. So literally like you're about to dump a million dollars into CapEx and you're gonna have a reassessment that just blew all your numbers out of the water. Yeah. The deal was still good. There was still enough meat in there where it was good, but like that alone could, could have killed the deal. Um, and you know, the sponsor had done two or three deals, but it, somewhere along the line, they just missed that or didn't know to check that, or, mm -hmm. you know, they got caught up in the excitement. So I'll go and vetting the deal. So geographic area, vet that, vet the deal. And then the third thing is the sponsor. So, you know, you could have the best business in the world, not even in real estate, you know, and one of the things I learned from being able to network on the nonprofit side with angel investors and uh, v, uh, VC folks out in California was one, they, ha they said, Hey, this ha business idea has to be a good idea. But more importantly, it's the people, right? I mean, you can have someone that has a dog shit idea, but if it's a killer team, they can pull it off they can create amazing marketing, they can really build it. But if you have a brilliant idea, and you have a crap team, they're going to waste your money. Mm -hmm. So I sort of really took that approach of learning from those angel investors and those VC folks of how they look at the team, and can the team actually pull off the deal. So, you know, there's everything from like, do they actually have the experience? Um, and I don't mind taking a little bit of a chance or a risk on folks if they're newer. So, you know, we invested in a, in a deal where, you know, the biggest deal that the person had previously done was like a 20 unit, and now they're going to a 50 unit, but they'd done a lot of 10, 15, 20 unit deals. So to me, that was a good enough scale, where if they were to come and say, hey, we're going to do a two or 300 unit apartment complex, I would have passed. Um, cause to me, they just didn't have that level of experience. Um, then you want to do some due diligence, like credit, you know, criminal screening. I mean, Google's your best friend. It's so easy now just to, um, on a new sponsor to, to be able to find some of that, that information of, uh, making sure they're a good character, that they've got the track record, that, that sort of thing. Cause if you're putting, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars with people, you, you want to make sure that they actually are going to be able to execute on, on that plan. Yeah, absolutely. This is like passive investor gold right here. Everybody should rewind the past couple minutes and listen to it again, because I think that's, you have such a sophisticated process as a passive investor. And, and I appreciate how you've taken what you've learned from talking with all these really smart people, these millionaires and billionaires, and how they look at deals, and you've incorporated that into your own strategy. But I, I think that's exactly right. You're evaluating the sponsor, the market, and then the deal. Right. And, and in that deal, you're getting into that, that nitty gritty and you're, you're active enough to, to at least do what I would consider kind of, you know, these are kind of the top level things they are not hard to do, like verify what other apartments in the area are getting for rent. Right. I mean, that that's an easy step. It doesn't take long. And you even mentioned a great tool like rent rentometer, which is an easy way to do that. It's free. Right. And then getting into some, like, just, just, asking questions about those assumptions right and how how valid are those assumptions how aggressive are those assumptions and and yeah and thinking about it in that way so so i really appreciate your approach as a passive investor to evaluating those deals yeah you know i'll, I'll throw in one fourth thing is you know if you're just putting in a small dollar amount or you're putting in the minimum you can't really request major changes to the mou or the ppm but you should at least have a lawyer read through that for you, right? I mean, nine times out of 10, it's going to be fine, but you just want to double check, especially if you've never worked with someone before and you're not good at understanding all the legalese and that legal wording in a contract, you know, spend the 200 bucks to go sit down with a lawyer for an hour to read through and just have them pull out things and make sure you actually understand what, what you're getting into. And, you know, that goes back to earlier, what I mentioned where, you know, unsophisticated friends would say, Oh yeah, I'm getting an 8% guaranteed rate of return. And it's like, no, you're not, you're getting a preferred rate of return. There, there's a difference in there. And 
if, if you're starting to get into that passive investing, I'd say that fourth thing would be just go sit down with a lawyer to have them explain the PPM for you or any of the other legal documents before you sign them. Um, yeah, I think it's a couple hundred bucks that's well spent. You know, yeah. especially if it's your your first or second deal and you're not used to it, right? Because, yeah. I mean, there there are things out there that are difficult to understand. I think, like you hit on the nail on the head on like the the preferred return being looked at as a guarantee, right? I mean, nothing yeah. in, in the deals are a guarantee. You're higher on the on the totem pole as far as getting getting that return, but nothing is guaranteed. And then the other one I I like to tell people to watch for us. I'll mention it again on this show is understand how like the difference between a return of capital and a return on capital and yeah. understand how your distributions are being classified because I mean, there are sponsors out there that, that will look at distributions as a return of capital and in that way they're, you're reducing the you know your capital balance in the deal and and your preferred return which is calculated off of that and and ultimately what you know you're, you're working your, your way down um, and working your return down so I mean, just things that are really important to understand that that really that PPM is that Bible for the deal. And, uh, you know, if it says something in, in the fancy presentation that they sent you, but it says something different in the PPM, it's going to be the PPM that's going to rule the day, right? Yeah. And then the operating agreements as well. So make sure that things tick and tie and that things match up. Yeah, one of the other ones I'll, I'll mention on there is, you know, a lot of times people will per project like a, Hey, we're, we're targeting a seven to 8% cash on cash return. And, you know, we're going to start doing distributions, you know, three months in a lot of times that's projected out over the lifetime of the hold period where they might say, Hey, you know, the first distribution isn't actually going to be that seven or 8% because you're in that value add stage, or maybe that first distribution is set out six, nine, 12 months, because that first year is all about, um, implementing that value add, there's going to be a lot of uh, turnover, which means higher, higher vacancy, and less actual cash flow. Um, I had a, a friend, re retired guy that was counting on that, you know, seven, 8% for cash flow, because he wanted to live off of it. And mm -hmm. when we were going through the deal and the pro forma and the PPM, I was like, yeah, you're not probably going to get any money for the first six to nine months. Um, you'll average that 7% cash on cash, you know, over the whole period. So there's little things like that. If, you know, I love how you said it, the PPM is, is the Bible, you know, it, it's, it's what is going to, you know, really be the, the meat of the deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are fantastic tips. That's awesome. Thanks, Andrew. And um, so just to, to kind of move past, we talked a lot about your passive investing, right? But but your passive investing is, is all really to to fund your bigger purpose, right? So, so tell me a little bit about how, you know, you've, how that passive investing portfolio, like what what has that allowed you now to do? Yeah, so you know, I mentioned my my starting stipend in the nonprofit sector was you know eight hundred dollars a month, and then I moved to a salary of two thousand and. I realized, hey, this isn't going to be sustainable long term. I, you know, I don't necessarily need to drive a fancy car or live in a giant house. I want a comfortable life. You know, we like to fly business class when when we travel abroad. So the idea was early on, could I live just off of the nonprofit salary while I build the real estate income? and then use that to be the retirement account. You know, when I started in, in the nonprofit world, I also didn't have any um, benefits. So there's no retirement plan, no 401k, no, you know, health insurance plan. I had to buy health insurance on the market. So I knew I couldn't have a more comfortable lifestyle financially. And I, you know, retirement, I had to figure it out all on my own. So the, the idea was build that. So now all of a sudden, I didn't have to say no to a nonprofit job because of money or, you know, I wasn't necessarily living paycheck to paycheck anymore. And all of a sudden, when you didn't have that financial stress, it just makes life so much easier and you can focus on doing the, the work that you love. Yeah, that's awesome. And so what are what are the nonprofits now that, that you're working on? 
Yeah, so right now I actually work with uh, the Coast Guard Foundation. Uh, so we specifically support the men and women and their families uh, of the Coast Guard. So we've got a education initiative and uh, this isn't a, a foundation I started, I, I work for them. They've been around for 51, 52 years. Um, so they do scholarships for the children of retired Coast Guard members and active duty members. We do scholarships for the spouses uh, because a lot of times, as someone, you know, moves every two years or three years, will help their spouse um, continue their education, or maybe they were licensed to do a job in one state, now they got to get relicensed. So we'll cover that licensing fee. Uh, we do workforce development. So that way, as folks are transitioning out, they're able to land better jobs. Uh, we've got a fallen hero fund uh, for the folks that pass away in the line of duty. Um, and then we do a lot of stuff with morale and wellness where, you know, a, a small army by base might be five or 6,000 people. A lot of the Coast Guard units are 20 people out on a remote uh, part of town. So, you know, when you're on that big giant military base, you got the movie theater, the commissary, the school, the daycare, you know, you can't put all it, all that support infrastructure when there's a small little 50 year old building that only 20 people are in there. So we'll go in and provide like gym equipment and some recreation equipment just to help with morale and wellness for the folks. We'll do a lot of things like help put in barbecues that way, you know, the 20 people stationed at the unit and their families can all get together once a week and have a nice grill to do a barbecue um, and, and cook out on. So uh, again, I, I, I love the nonprofit work, right? I mean, it's, it's this idea of, it's my purpose. It's what I feel good about. And I let real estate build the long-term wealth so I can do this nonprofit work. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, I, I think a lot of people could just sit on the beach and, and drink Mai Tais, right? With, with the position you're in, but you've used this real estate to really allow you. I mean, it's a lot of what, what like people advertise, right? It's like real estate to live the life of your dreams or that you want to, and you're actually, uh, you've actually realized that you're actually doing it. So I think it's just a really uh, it's an inspiring story, I think, for for myself, for others to hear like all the good that can be done once you've got that financial security in place. And, you know, I, obviously for me, it's the nonprofit thing, but something that probably anyone can relate to that's still working a job, it, you're in a really different position when, I don't ever say, want to say you don't need the paycheck anymore, but all of a sudden now, you know, you're like, Hey, if I got fired, like, cool, I don't have to rush out and find a new job. All of a sudden you're now not afraid to speak up in that meeting or you're not afraid to take that risk. And, you know, that was part of why that first nonprofit I worked for, you know, we scaled them up to over $3 million a year. When I started working with them, they had annual revenue of half a million. A part of that was me be willing to take risks to try things. And then the founder was very open to that as well. And I wasn't afraid to sit down with them and say, hey, I think that's wrong. Or um, I like this idea. And every nonprofit I've worked for since then, I got recruited for. Um, and all of a sudden, it's very easy to climb that corporate ladder when you're not afraid to speak up um, and I found when you have that real estate, all of a sudden now at work, you're a little more bold. You got a little bit more confidence and, you know, don't be cocky and in that side of it, but that confidence helps you be better at that job. And all of a sudden you can start to climb that corporate ladder even quicker. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I'm glad you made that point because you know, I always think about it as like, well, at least you have a plan B if like, if, if you get laid off, right, which happens every day to folks they don't expect, but hadn't ever really thought of it as, as that extra boost of confidence that, that, that it's kind of, it goes back to whether you have that scarcity mindset and you're always yeah. worried about, you know, I don't want to say something because you know, I need this paycheck and like, what's going to happen if I don't have it, right? And, and kind of living in that fear versus just being open to say, you know what, let's, Let's try it out. You know, maybe I'll say something. Maybe my boss doesn't agree with, but you know what? Who cares? Because because I've got my backup plan. I, like I love that. Just that kind of. I mean, that's just. It's got to be just a good feeling to be in that place, right? To not have to worry 
about that that primary income source and, and only having one stream of income? Well, you know, the second nonprofit I, I got recruited to go work for, they were actually in a downward spiral. They were bleeding. They basically had a couple good years when the founder had a book and he got a, a full ride to Harvard um, to, for graduate school. He had a lot of PR right when he got out of the military. Um, and he was had a nonprofit that was doing an aid work in Kenya. And then as he was transitioning out of working out of the nonprofit and trying to have the nonprofit work on his own, their revenue was drastically dropping, you know, three years in a row. And I don't want to say it was like a, a, a sinking ship, but how many people want to go work for a company that is in a downward spiral? To me, that was a fun challenge of like, oh, I see what a lot of their problems are. I can come in and put in a strategy and execute really well on this strategy to turn it around where most other folks would have said like, uh Oh, I, I don't know that that's a risk. You know, I, I might be out of a job in six months or a year where again, I didn't have that scarcity mindset of like, cool, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'm, I'm comfortable. Like I, at that point, I couldn't just stop working altogether, but I, I could easily go find another job. And if it took a while to find a job, it wasn't a big deal. So it gives you that, that flexibility as well to go try other jobs. Yeah, that's awesome. It gave you the ability to take on a job that most people wouldn't be able to, right? Because yeah. they, they need that paycheck. That would be too scary to, like you said, you know, you don't want to jump on the sinking ship, but you were able to have a huge impact. So yeah. Really cool. Lo love the story, Andrew, and I appreciate you sharing it all with us. And I think giving some inspiration to me and me and folks about what we can achieve with that financial freedom. Um, I want to take you through our keys to success round. I've got four questions I want to ask you. Yeah. The first one I, I think, man, is right up your alley. So it's as an investor, if you could only ask one question to a deal sponsor, what is that one question you should ask? Ooh, there's so many. My my default is what what's your biggest failure, right? Like if we're not talking about a specific deal, but you know, I'm betting them, I want to know, are they actually going to be truthful on where they've made a mistake? And what did they learn from that mistake, right? Because everyone is going to make a mistake at some point. It's how you handle those mistakes and those failures it is where I see where personal growth happens. And I like someone that gets knocked down and gets back up and keeps on going versus if someone's never had any mistakes, they're lying to you, right? Or they've only been in the market that is drastically rising when mm -hmm. it's easy to be successful. Right, right. Rising tide raises all ships. What are you most proud of in your career? <sighs> Being able to do just the nonprofit work, right? I mean, I, I love real estate, um, but it, it's that nonprofit where I can help folks that are disadvantaged. And then at, at the same time, you know, the, my website and podcast that I started was to help the average investor get started or the average American get started. So being able to help you know, the nonprofit worker that's only making 30,000 a year, go out and house hack and save, you know, a thousand bucks on their housing costs, that all of a sudden makes it easier for them to do their job. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. What's a book that everybody should read? Ooh, there's so many, but right now I'm a uh, profit first. So it, it's a little outside of real estate investing, but it's a way of sort of managing your accounting and your financing for uh, a, a business. I think it you can apply it to your real estate and business, but now that I've, I've got a media company and I'm investing in other businesses, I, I love it. Uh, it's called Profit First. I forget the author's name, but it's a great way about how you put allocations in your business in the, the money that comes in and making sure you actually pay yourself first as the entrepreneur, the investor, and then you put limits on how much you reinvest in the business. So it, it's a phenomenal book. I'm about 90% through with it right now. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely make sure we check that out. And lastly, what is your number one key to success? Uh, to me, I think it has to be persistence, right? I mean, it, it's so easy to get disenfranchised, to run into problems and just you know, something comes up and I'm like, great, I'll figure it out. Like I'll solve the problem. I'm going to be persistent and, and keep going through it. 
Yeah, I, I think that's so critical. And I mean, that has been a common theme to, to the answer for that question of successful people on this show. It is persistence. It's about, like you said, being able to get knocked down, but get, getting up again, getting up one more time than you've been knocked down. Right. I mean, I just, I think it just shows what it takes really to be successful in anything. It, it is about that persistence. So, well, Andrew, thank you so much for, for sharing all this great info today. If folks want to learn more about you and, and what you're doing, your website, your podcast, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, my website's uh, F-I-B-Y-R-E-I.com. So Fibirea and the podcast is The House Hacking Podcast. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure that we have all that in the show notes so you guys can scroll down and check that out. And again, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really had a great conversation today. Yeah, man. Awesome. Thank you so much.